Uh, first of all, welcome um, for for those of you uh, who I haven't met me yet. Uh, I'm Mike Pillock, one of the partners at Odell. I've uh, been with Odell for for 13 years now, and it's really the only true job I've had outside of uh, going to school to do engineering. So um, we, we've been here a while. Um, our presentation today is going to be based on gas detection and fundamentals of gas detection. Um, from an Odell standpoint, we've done everything from Zamboni rooms to refrigerant rooms to just general car parks, um, distilleries, you name it. We've we've likely seen the application. Um, and every time I bring it up to our presenter, Ron, and I think it's a creative idea. He just uh, he's seen it a million times before, so it's not as interesting to him. Um, but anyways, um, our presenter today will be Ron Sweet. Uh, Ron is an electronics engineering technologist where uh, he spent a quarter century as a wireless telecommunication industry or in the well, wireless telecommunications industry um, before he joined on with CET. Um, so he has been with CET or Critical Environment Technologies for 18 years. Uh, just put that in perspective, Odell has been representing Critical Environment Technologies for, for 21 years, uh, which I think are two pretty cool uh, milestones. Um, Ron, I'll, I'll let you take it from here, but um, if there are questions, we will have a Q&A at the end of this session. Um, but if there is something that you do want to ask um, during the presentation, uh, I, there is a chat button there that you can place it in. Um, feel free to do so. I'll be monitoring it and um, interrupt Ron when, when I need to. So, uh, Ron, take it away. Thank you, Mike, and welcome, everybody. Thank you for taking uh, time out of your busy schedule to uh, join us on this webinar today. What I'm gonna be talking about today is the uh, fundamentals of gas detection. They don't teach um, a lot of this in, uh, in engineering school. Uh, and I know um, that uh, a foundation of understanding helps create uh, a, a, a more um, rounded understanding of how gas detection in the HVAC industry is even relevant. So what we're gonna cover today is why gas detection is a part of the HVAC marketplace. What are typical gas sensors? How does a gas detection system work? What is this three-step approach that critical environment um, stands by and advocates uh, to make the whole gas detection uh, process um, much simpler? And we'll touch on some of the applications. And then, as Mike mentioned, hopefully we'll have a bit of time for a question and answer session. So why do we use gas detection in the HVAC industry at all? Two reasons, and only two reasons. You're either trying to protect people from unsafe or high levels of toxic gas within a building envelope, or you're trying to protect the property from combustible or explosive gases that may build up in that building envelope. In both of these scenarios, you're setting up the ventilation system so that you can dilute, dilute these gas concentrations through ventilation. So dilution through ventilation, which means you've basically set up a demand controlled ventilation system controlled by the gas detection system, seeing unsafe levels of either a toxic gas or a combustible or a flammable gas. So in doing so, you get to run the ventilation fans only when required at high speed. You get to control fan runtime and avoid wear and tear on the uh, ventilation components. And more importantly, you're using minimal heating and cooling uh, um, energy uh, for the makeup air that you have to bring into the building when you're ventilating air out of the building. So you're not only protecting the environment, but you're saving money. You're not writing blank checks to the utility companies because you're purging 100,000 cubic feet of air out of a building envelope when uh, an unsafe level of either toxic or flammable or explosive gas is built up. You're controlling it you're controlling those concentrations through um, minimum ventilation. More and more, the regulatory authorities are getting involved. 
I um, equate the gas detection industry to the fire detection industry in that they both protect uh, building envelopes, uh, the people in the building envelopes or the building envelope from blowing up or burning down. And the regulatory authorities that are involved range from OSHA to NIOSH to ACGIH, um, Canada's equivalent of all of these different organizations, ASHRAE, the International Mechanical Code, and the environmental protection agencies in the various uh, jurisdictions where uh, we operate. It all starts with uh, the American Conference of Government and Industrial Hygienists, who put together a handbook of uh, threshold limit values and biological exposure indices um, in workplace environments for various uh, uh, chemicals and uh, substances um, that you may come into contact with in a workplace environment. ACGIH is a volunteer group. Uh, volunteers uh, from the medical and scientific uh, communities who make these recommendations in regards to these threshold limit values and biological exposure indices. Uh, they make these recommendations to uh, NIOSH, the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health in the United States and Canada's own uh, sister organization, uh, the Health and Safety Organization of Canada. Um, they make these recommendations uh, and NIOSH in the United States publishes these on their portal on the CDC's website. And I have in front of you right now, one of the pages from their publication that's on that uh, portal. And this particular one is nitrogen dioxide, NO2, which is a constituent of uh, vehicle exhaust. And down in the bottom left corner in the uh, red uh, uh, um, uh, rectangle, uh, I've got um, the exposure limits. The NIOSH recommended exposure limit, short term one ppm, the OSHA permissible exposure limit, ceiling of five ppm, and right down in the very bottom left corner, the immediate danger to life and health, the concentration at which this gas poses an immediate danger to life and health for human beings. On the screen is 20 ppm, but over the last uh, 12 months, they've lowered that now to 13 ppm for NO2. 13 ppm. Compare that to carbon monoxide, uh, the immediate danger to life and health is 1200 ppm. So it shows you just the uh, uh, toxicity level of nitrogen dioxide uh, from vehicle exhaust. So ACGIH um, sets or recommends these threshold limit values uh, based on time weighted averages and threshold limit values based on short term exposure limits and a threshold limit value maximum or ceiling that should not be exceeded during any part of the workday. And these are used as a uh, 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 information to uh, NIOSH uh, so that NIOSH can publish uh, recommendations on the CDC's, uh, uh, on their portal on the CDC's website. The types of hazardous gases we're talking about are toxic gases like carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, ammonia, chlorine, sulfur dioxide. Um, there's a, a quite a list. And these toxic gases are typically measured in parts per million or parts per billion. Parts per million or parts per billion uh, exposure limits that you don't want to uh, exceed uh, so that you can protect people from being overexposed and create long-term health effects. Then there's combustible gases. Combustible gases are monitored in percent of their lower explosive limit or percent LEL. The concentration that you do not want to uh, reach in a building envelope because if that concentration is reached and there's an introduction of ignition or, or a source of ignition, then there's a possibility of an explosion or a fire. And combustible gases like methane, propane, hydrogen that's created from the charging of lead acid batteries, and there's quite a list of combustible gases as well. Then there's simple refrigerants, and refrigerants, again, measured in parts per million. 
although uh, some of the refrigerants at very high concentrations are flammable, uh, some of the newer refrigerants at uh, uh, high concentrations uh, uh, simply displace oxygen and be and and present an asphyxiant gas type scenario. And then there's uh, a number of different refrigerants that are toxic to human beings. So they are measured in parts per million. And now the refrigerants that um, are not toxic to human beings and are not flammable, creating uh, an asphyxiant type gas, um, the ambient atmosphere around us is made up of approximately 21% oxygen and 78% nitrogen. The oxygen is the lighter of the two. However, that's what we need to sustain life. So an asphyxiant gas is a gas that will push um, the oxygen concentration out of the ambient atmosphere, creating an asphyxiant type scenario. And to understand uh, an asphyxiant gas, I always ask the question, um, do you know the difference between being asphyxiated or drowning? Drowning, you have a fighting chance. Being asphyxiated, it's like somebody licked a light switch. If you've ever been for a dental or medical procedure where the anesthesiologist gassed you, that's what it's like to be asphyxiated. Because when that anesthesiologist puts that little mask over your mouth and nose, he asks you to count backwards from 10. And most people don't even remember saying nine, let alone eight. So it happens that fast. So if you walk into uh, a room um, that has been uh, filled up with uh, uh, CO2 uh, from a leak in a, a tank of CO2, that room uh, fills up quite rapidly, number one, because that CO2 is under high pressure and there's a, a high volume in that tank. And number two, it's heavier than the ambient atmosphere. So even though it's mixing with the ambient atmosphere, the highest concentrations are going to be at the lowest point in that building envelope, um, the area that you're going to fall into. Your mouth and nose, your breathing apparatus is going to be approximately two to three inches off the floor. And that's where the heaviest concentration of that CO2 is going to be. And if that CO2 has reached a high enough level and pushed that oxygen uh, towards zero, then brain death can happen in a matter of moments. So regulatory authorities are uh, really um, concentrating and paying attention uh, to the various gases that create an asphyxian type atmosphere. <clears throat> then there's volatile organic compounds. Volatile organic compounds are created by the fact that everything around us is in constant decay. Um, in that we don't really see the decay on a day-to-day -day basis, but if you walked away from a building uh, and and nobody touched it for 25 years, and I'm sure we've all seen pictures of this, you can actually see the decay process that building has gone through over that 25 years. It's our day-to-day -day cleaning and maintenance and upkeep that keeps all of our buildings from looking like some of the pictures we've seen of abandoned buildings. So these volatile organic compounds are uh, molecules that are given off during that decay process. And in a tight building envelope, and our, our building envelopes have become much tighter than uh, 10, 15, 20, 25 years ago. So in a very tight building envelope, um, these uh, VOC molecules can build up uh, to a point where they create health effects uh, for the people inside the building envelope. And that's why uh, volatile organic compounds have become the new sick building syndrome. Uh, whereby you hear of uh, uh, people complaining of headaches, nausea, blurred vision, uh, a number of different uh, health effects. And they find that by monitoring the VOC con uh, uh, concentrations and uh, activating the ventilation as uh, to keep those concentrations low, then all of those health uh, um, problems that have been reported uh, seem to uh, disappear. And then there's particulates, the newest uh, 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 capability uh, within the gas detection industry, simply because of all the research and development done on uh, particulate sensors, uh, we can now, the gas detection industry can now offer uh, very economical and very reliable 
uh, particulate sensors that will monitor the particulate in the ambient atmosphere down to uh, uh, PM 2.5, which is unheard of uh, five or uh, three, three to five years ago. But now uh, we can offer that kind of thing. So for monitoring uh, dusts and smoke and pollen and spores build up in a in a building envelope, we can now offer particulate sensors that can activate the ventilation based on the concentration of particulates in that building envelope. So that's uh, 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 a recap of all the different areas that gas detection systems can be involved in to control ventilation systems. And they all start with gas sensors. These gas sensors are very, very small devices. The one in the top left center, top left area of the screen here is about the diameter of a 25 cent piece. Um, the big one in the uh, uh, cluster in the in the center left of your screen is about the size around of a, 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 a loony. And the one at the very bottom of the left of your screen, uh, the long uh, brownish one, is about the size of a double A battery. And these sensor elements work on the premise of the natural diffusion and convection of the ambient atmosphere, regardless of any outside uh, force on that ambient atmosphere, like a fan or or uh, outside airflow coming into it. And they work on uh, the natural diffusion and convection of the ambient atmosphere, just like a thermostat, just like the little thermistor inside a thermostat that's sitting on the wall that's monitoring the temperature of the room and bringing on uh, the furnace when it gets too cold or bringing on the air conditioning when it gets too warm. And we all know that you can cover a fair size room with a single thermostat on the wall. Um, simply because of the natural diffusion and convection of the ambient atmosphere, those thermostats uh, can basically um, very, fairly accurately measure the temperature within that whole room from a single unit on the wall. So these little gas sensors are designed such that they will output a small current or a small voltage, uh, minute voltage or current, when they come into contact with the uh, 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 target gas that they were manufactured and designed for. Any concentration of that target gas will cause that sensor to start outputting uh, a minute current or minute voltage. A gas detection device contains circuitry that allows for the amplification and noise reduction of that minute signal into a useful signal that can be um, deployed in an HVAC scenario, something like a 4 to 20 milliamp signal, a 0 to 10 volt DC signal, uh, some type of digital signal like uh, Modbus or BACnet, a usable signal for uh, uh, the HVAC industry. That signal um, is then taken through what's known as a, a gas detection control, uh, whether that be a building automation system or uh, the gas detection controller, and utilized to uh, activate the ventilation so that you have dilution through ventilation of any concentration of buildup of the target gas, whether it be flammable or toxic. Now, on your screen, uh, on the screen right now on the left side there, I've got uh, a picture of an oxygen sensor. That oxygen sensor is uh, in diameter is approximately the size of a 25 cent piece. That oxygen sensor is filled with an electrolyte. That electrolyte in quiescent state, in other words, when there's no uh, voltage or current flowing through that sensor element, is um, much more of a gel, um, almost a solid gel. Once the current and voltage uh, flows through that sensor element when it's plugged into the circuit, that gel inside the sensor element becomes a little more pliable such that as the ambient atmosphere flows across the top where you see that white portion on the top, that's a filter. That's a filter that will keep out particulates but allow the ambient atmosphere's molecules to enter into that cell and cause a reaction with that electrolyte. 
that electro that electrolyte in conjunction with the ambient atmosphere flowing into that cell will accurately monitor the concentration of oxygen within the ambient atmosphere. Conversely, there is an infrared sensor for the measurement of uh, uh, CO2 or refrigerant gases or combustible gases. An infrared sensor works on the premise that uh, infrared energy will be absorbed by the high carbon molecule content of refrigerants, CO2, or uh, combustible or flammable gases. Inside that cell, there's a little infrared uh, uh, transmitter uh, on the left side of that circuit board. And on the right side, there is a receiver. And a very simplified uh, uh, drawing of uh, energy being transmitted, uh, reflected off the uh, mirror, uh, mirror, uh, mirrored inside of that sensor cell and picked up by the receiver. In reality, there's a lot more than just two of those. That, that whole cell would be filled with refractions of uh, infrared energy being transmitted and infrared energy being received. And the ambient atmosphere, as it diffuses into that cell, um, with any high carbon content, um, uh, a portion of that infrared energy would be absorbed. And the microprocessor uh, on that circuit board contains an algorithm uh, monitoring the um, uh, infrared energy that was transmitted versus the infrared energy that was uh, received. And if, for instance, one nanowatt of energy was transmitted, but only half a nanowatt of infrared energy was received, then that microprocessor calculates that based on a half a nanowatt of inf infrared energy being absorbed, you have this concentration of that target gas in the ambient atmosphere. So um, the sensor cells in uh, gas detection industry work on various principles. And those principles range from electrochemical cells for monitoring toxic gases, simply because an electrolyte can be uh, chemically mixed to have a high reactivity to various toxic gases. Then there's solid state metal oxide semiconductor sensors that have been around since the uh, uh, innovation in uh, transistor development. And uh, these sensor cells will, um, to high concentrations, will react to high concentrations of combustible gases and refrigerant gases. Um, when gas detection industry first started out, um, they were utilizing solid state sensors to monitor toxic gases, but found that they could not uh, monitor or detect uh, very low limits, uh, very low PPM uh, concentrations of toxic gases in general. That pre that prefaced the uh, uh, um, research and development of the electrochemical cell. So now solid state sensors are typically relegated to combustible gases and refrigerants simply because the concentrations of concern of those two uh, different uh, classifications of gases are much higher PPM than toxic or uh, oxygen uh, concentrations in the ambient atmosphere. Then there's catalytic pellister sensors. Catalytic pellister sensors uh, migrated over to the um, uh, commercial and industrial gas detection uh, market space from uh, the petrochemical industry where they've been used for probably about 50 years. And they're very good and very accurate for monitoring uh, low levels, as well as high levels of combustible or explosive gases. So the two that work on light sources, non-dispersive infrared or infrared sensors in general, in general, and photoionization devices. Of course, the infrared uh, sensor elements work on the premise of infrared energy being absorbed by carbon content, high carbon content in uh, the target gas. Photoionization devices work on a, on a ultraviolet light and work on the premise that ultraviolet light will ionize um, VOC molecules and some toxic gas molecules. And when those uh, molecules are ionized, 
they can be collected on a, a negative plate and the concentration monitored through the amount that are uh, those molecules that are collected on that plate, um, creating a higher resistance and causing more current to flow through the device. And the algorithm in the microprocessor can then accurately measure and, mo and state that you've got this concentration of volatile organic compounds or total volatile organic compounds in the ambient atmosphere. So those are the different types of technologies and their space in the gas detection industry uh, portion of the HVAC industry. They all have a shelf life. They don't last forever. At some point in time, they need to be installed in the equipment and get out to the field. They need to see uh, uh, voltage and current power flowing through them uh, to keep them um, uh, operational. And they all have a lifespan. They all have a lifespan in that eventually they're going to uh, stop working. They're going to stop working to manufacture specifications or they're going to stop completely. So at some point in time, they're going to have to be replaced. Uh, even sensors that work on the premise of a light source, uh, we all know that uh, light bulbs and, and light sources uh, other than the sun don't live forever. And they're all going to require a calibration uh, servicing uh, at some point in time. That calibration servicing um, compensates for the decay curve uh, from their day of birth to the end of their life. Uh, over that period of time, they are uh, decaying to the point where there's no output. However, proper calibration can adjust them such that they're still monitoring um, the concentration of the target gas in the ambient atmosphere accurately. So with uh, a proper calibration, gas sensors can last re re and monitor the ambient atmosphere accurately for the target gas uh, right up until they fail to operate at all. When you're designing a gas detection system, some of the things that you have to bear in mind. If you're monitoring toxic gases for the safety of human beings, you have to monitor them in the breathing zone. That's how and why these gases are toxic to human beings. They breathe these uh, toxic gases in, and when they breathe these toxic gases in, and, and that toxic gas has entered their lungs, it now gets into their bloodstream and, and gets into all of the different organs in their body. So if you don't know what people are breathing, then you're not properly monitoring the ambient atmosphere where these people are working for the safety of those human beings. So toxic gases must be monitored in the breathing zone so that you are properly protecting the people. If you're monitoring combustible, or uh, refrigerant gases, lighter than air gases, are going to migrate. Even though the ambient atmosphere is constantly in motion, um, those lighter than air gases will uh, pool and collect at the higher um, highest point in the building envelope. So that's where you want to monitor the concentration buildup. That's where it's going to be a danger. If those gases are heavier than the ambient atmosphere, refrigerants and, and some uh, uh, combustible gases, you're going to monitor them down by the floor because they're going to pool down at the lowest point of the envelope. That's where the concentration is really going to build up much more rapidly than throughout the rest of the atmosphere within that building envelope. But you don't want to place those sensors right on the floor where uh, any spills uh, can uh, adversely affect the sensors, or any possibility of cleaning machinery moving around could uh, damage the sensors. You're going to try and keep them between uh, uh, 15 to 30 centimeters from the floor, 6 to 12 inches, and they will still be able to monitor uh, the concentration buildup at that level and accurately report that to some type of control point that will either activate the ventilation for dilution or if the concentration uh, 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 becomes too uh, too high, uh, activate uh, some type of uh, audi audible and visual notification device. And sensor mounting location. 
uh, if possible, in refrigerant uh, or combustible gas uh, scenarios, getting those sensors uh, placed closest to the potential leak. So in a chiller room, for instance, having those refrigerant sensors close to where the piping comes into the compressor, that's typically where typically where that uh, refrigerant leak is going to take place. Or in uh, in the case of combustible gases, getting those sensors uh, close to the source. Uh, well, for instance, in a boiler room, if that boiler is being fed by natural gas, then where that natural gas piping is connected to that boiler is a typical area where you're going to see a leak. So having a combustible gas sensor uh, above that particular area will monitor that uh, um, um, area much more efficiently than if it was way off to the side or something. And remembering to keep those sensors away from fresh air sources or uh, rapidly moving air. So ventilation fans uh, creating a, a, a quickly moving airstream or openings uh, to the outside uh, air intakes. Um, it's going to uh, show um, clean air coming in when in reality towards the interior of that envelope that that sensor is monitoring, um, the concentration of that target gas uh, may still be quite high. But the sensor saying it's not seeing any gas because it's got that fresh air flow across it. And bearing in mind that at some point in time, um, these sensor elements, uh, these sensing devices are going to require some type of service, whether it's uh, access for calibration or whether it's access for sensor placement. So having those uh, 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 available uh, for access, uh, you must keep that in mind. Uh, for instance, uh, you, you have a small chiller room where they've already installed the first chiller and there's going to be a second chiller uh, installed somewhere uh, uh, later on. Uh, if those sensors are mounted, refrigerant sensors are mounted such that the placement of the second uh, chiller is going to block access to them, well, then those sensors have to be moved prior to that second chiller being installed or better yet, when the system's designed to begin with, knowing there's going to be a second uh, chiller at some point in time, uh, installing those sensors where they won't be blocked when that second chiller is installed. So little things like that to bear in mind in regards to sensor mounting location. And sensor coverage. Depending on the sensor, you can have anywhere from 3,000 to 8,000 square feet 279 square meters to 743 square meters of coverage out of a sensor. That's a radius of 31 to 50 feet or 9.5 to 15.25 meters radius. That's a large area, much larger than you could cover with a single thermostat. When those sensors are installed, I like to draw the analogy of an incandescent light bulb. If you take an incandescent light bulb, a standard light bulb, and you put it in a wall sconce and mount it on the wall, you get 180 degrees out of that light bulb. That's 50% efficiency. You take that same light bulb, you put it in a ceiling fixture, and mount it out towards the interior of that envelope you're trying to light up or trying to illuminate, and now you've got 360 degrees of light out of that light bulb. That's 100% efficiency. Likewise with a gas sensor. As I mentioned, these sensors work on the premise of natural diffusion and convection, let alone any other uh, uh, introduction of movement of uh, the ambient atmosphere around them. If you can have those sensors in towards uh, the area that they're monitoring, as opposed to on the perimeter walls, then you're going to get 360 degrees of diffusion and convection and ambient atmosphere movement around them. So they're going to have a much greater radius of coverage. So the first picture I showed you there was uh, an underground parking garage in a multi-use facility where they've got some uh, commercial uh, uh, um, um, uh, entities and, and some offices and, and a condominium above them. Um, you can see that if the sensors are mounted on support beams towards the interior of that uh, garage that you're trying to provide coverage for, they can monitor 360 degrees all the way around them as opposed to if those sensors were mounted on the perimeter walls. 
where all they could monitor was 180 de degrees uh, to the sides and to the front of them. So that's efficiency. That's efficiency, and you're going to utilize uh, less sensors uh, to provide adequate coverage uh, for that area. Likewise, the other end of that garage, and again, getting the sensors in towards the center on uh, support beams, um, support posts, uh, columns, um, allowing them to have 360 degrees of air movement around them whenever you can. Now, there's going to be times. There's going to be times when you're uh, uh, looking at an airplane hangar, for instance, or some of these newer uh, facilities that uh, 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 have uh, large spans uh, between um, the perimeter walls. Um, there are times when there are no support beams towards the interior. And in, in the case of an airplane hangar, you wouldn't want them. It's bad for the planes anyway. Uh, but there's going to be times when there's no support beams towards the interior. So um, doubling up, or not so much doubling up, but placing more sensors on the perimeter wall and, and not relying just on the uh, radius of coverage allows for those sensors to have greater monitoring effect of the full ambient atmosphere within that envelope that you're trying to monitor. So as opposed to placing your sensors uh, 100 feet apart, uh, maybe dropping that back to 60 feet apart um, so that you've got a few more sensors around the perimeter walls. And we all know that a uh, thermostat on a perimeter wall works fine. So gas sensors, um, a little closer spaced around that per perimeter wall, and the fact that the ambient atmosphere is in constant motion will uh, provide uh, fairly good coverage, even though you can't get them in towards um, the interior and placing them up on the uh, rafters towards the roof uh, provides no, uh, practically no coverage or, or, or protection for the humans that are going to be uh, inside that facility or for combustible gases that are heavier than the ambient atmosphere and going to build up at the lowest point. So, like I say, having a few more around the perimeter walls will allow for adequate coverage uh, in the uh, case that you can't get them on uh, support beams towards the interior. So how does all this work? Well, these sensors that are deployed, or in the case of a single sensor uh, uh, scenario where the uh, building envelope that you're trying to monitor is uh, small enough that it only requires one sensor, um, these sensors are monitoring in real time. Just like your thermostat on the wall is monitoring the temperature in real time, these gas detectors these sensors that are deployed throughout that uh, uh, envelope that you're monitoring are operating in real time. They're seeing the concentration of any target gas in that ambient atmosphere in real time, such that if a source of toxic gas comes along or is created and that toxic gas starts to build up, that constant communication going back to a control point or a controller, and that control point could be a building automation system or a direct digital control system or a gas detection controller. That information constantly going back to that control point and that control point being programmed or set up to know that it is going to operate the ventilation based on uh, uh, concentration buildup of the target gas in the ambient atmosphere such that it can dilute that concentration buildup and bring the ambient atmosphere back to safe levels, it's going to provide that information to the ventilation system. That ventilation system is going to activate and that gas concentration is going to drop and come back to normal levels. If for some reason, if for some reason there's too, large, too, too many sources of that toxic gas or combustible gas, uh, or if a ventilation component failed, like a, a, a fresh air damper didn't open or the fan didn't start, um, then other information can be relayed out, uh, knowing that that concentration has built up beyond unsafe ventilation levels and is approaching levels that uh, we would call high alarm. Then information can be relayed out to an outside source or in the worst case scenario, uh, first responders to uh, attend the site to see what it exactly is going on. So knowing uh, you're setting up this gas detection system, 
uh, as a uh, um, demand control ventilation system uh, in the first scenario. And in the second scenario, when the gases build up, the target gases build up uh, beyond uh, just uh, uh, dilution through ventilation, you can activate audible and visual alarms to tell people to uh, vacate the area. You can report it to a building automation system or a direct digital control system, or you can send some type of signaling to an external monitoring station, uh, the building maintenance people, or the HVAC contractor that's uh, uh, maintaining the facility, or uh, to first responders if, if such a scenario should arise. But knowing that up front when you're designing that gas detection system allows for that third party um, control uh, to be designed and work the way it was intended to work to begin with. And that leads us right into this three step approach that we advocate. And I know Adele, Adele, Odell has uh, uh, utilized this in uh, uh, many different scenarios that they get involved in. And this three step approach really simplifies thing, things in regards to um, uh, deploying or specifying a gas detection system. Understanding the application, identifying the target gases, and the possibility of any other uh, gas that uh, could possibly uh, be in that area that you want to watch out for, uh, allows for recommending the appropriate products, no matter who the manufacturer is, uh, recommending the appropriate products to uh, come up with a design that is going to keep uh, the people within that building envelope safe or keep that building envelope safe in the case of combustible or explosive gases. And when I say understanding the application, there's a number of different things, uh, different um, parameters that come into play in regards to the application. So if somebody comes to me and says, Ron, we've got a logistics center, and we need a gas detection system for this. Well, I know right away that there's a, a vehicle exhaust because there's large transports coming in uh, to the main loading docks. And then there's delivery vehicles uh, rolling up to the uh, uh, smaller uh, um, load up docks. So I know right away there's going to be all kinds of uh, uh, vehicle exhaust to be monitoring. So now I want to know how many square feet, what's the square meters, how, what's the size of this facility, because that's going to dictate the number of sensors that are required. Um, is the ventilation uh, system spread out throughout the facility such that I can zone it if it's a very large place? There's no sense uh, ventilating an area uh, that has no toxic gas buildup if uh, there's the possibility of zoning uh, and only activating the vent ventilation where the uh, concentration of gas is built up to the point of concern. Um, how are the fans being operated? What's the fan schedule? Are these fans on VFDs? Are they direct drive motors? Are they ECM motors? Uh, are, are the fans actually being operated by the building automation system? And I'm just, uh, my gas detection system is just telling the building automation system uh, when they should bring on the uh, uh, ventilation. Is it classified area? Is it classified hazardous by the electrical engineer? Do I need explosion proof equipment in there? Is it a standalone system or is it being interconnected to a third party? Is it a wet environment? Are there regular washdowns? Uh, fire stations? Um, yeah, the firemen will take their vehicles out on the uh, um, um, asphalt apron uh, during the warm weather, nice weather, uh, to wash down the vehicles. But in the wintertime, in the inclement weather, they're inside washing down those vehicles. So there's a possibility of any gas detectors in there any electronics in there uh, being sprayed during those uh, washdowns. And knowing that up front allows for uh, um, uh, the electronics uh, to be protected such that it's not going to fall victim to uh, any uh, direct sprays or anything of that nature. Or is there any expectation of extreme temperature swings? Knowing that up front allows the proper uh, equipment to be deployed, equipment that can withstand. Uh, uh, large fluctuations uh, of extreme temperatures. Identifying the target gases, knowing the application, knowing whether or not it's an ice arena, knowing whether or not it's a chiller room, knowing whether or not it's a, a logistics center, knowing whether or not it's a, a greenhouse application where they're going to be deploying CO2 uh, to feed the plants, um, knowing whether or not it's a car park, uh, an underground parking garage, 
um, knowing that application, um, you know pretty much the target gases you're going to be looking for. Now, one thing I would point out, um, chlorine use in swimming pools um, for cleaning the pool water. And the um, uh, the amount of uh, um, interest in, in maintaining um, the uh, pH balance of the water uh, after it's gone through that chlorine bath, such that there are no chloramines um, produced in the ambient air uh, once that uh, chlorinated water is returned to the pool. Um, what I've seen in uh, the uh, public space, uh, swimming pools, public uh, swimming pools, um, once that water has gone through the chlorine bath, um, they're giving it a uh, uh, high concentrations of CO2 aeration. And that uh, high concentration of CO2 aeration helps to maintain the pH, pH balance of the water when it's returned to the pool, such that they mitigate any possibility of chloramine buildup. So these are some of the different things that I've seen uh, in regards to the use of high concentration concentrations of carbon dioxide inside building envelopes. And knowing that carbon dioxide is a very dangerous asphyxiant gas um, in pretty much all of North America now, uh, there are rules and regulations in regards to uh, wherever there's a, a carbon dioxide cylinder or some type of use inside a building envelope, there must be a carbon dioxide detector and audible visual notification appliances if that carbon dioxide leaks and starts to build up in that building envelope. So knowing all the the number, the first uh, step and the second step of that three-step uh, um, um, process allows for the selection of the appropriate products, whether it be transmitters, sensor transmitters deployed throughout the space um, that you're trying to monitor, or whether or not uh, it's control points, or whether or not the, the, the area is small enough that you can use a completely self-contained um, a sensor transmitter and uh, ventilation control uh, type system like you see on the top right corner of your screen. And along with that, the various remote and peripheral devices that will be required um, to finish that gas detection system uh, and make it uh, totally applicable uh, to the application that you're trying to uh, um, uh, have uh, on your plans drawings. Some of the applications we get involved in on a daily basis range anywhere from parking garages right through to uh, laboratories, uh, MRI rooms, uh, commercial kitchens, wastewater treatment sensors, centers, uh, uh, welding shops, wineries and breweries, micro wineries, micro breweries, micro distilleries. All of these different applications we get involved with on a daily basis on a daily basis. And because we were born and bred in uh, uh, Vancouver, Delta, BC, um, we do a lot of work with all the ferries uh, on both coasts of Canada um, through our partner uh, out in uh, St. John, Newfoundland uh, and our dealer down in uh, um, uh, Halifax. Uh, we've done a lot of work on uh, the ferries that transport uh, goods and uh, uh, transportation and people um, to the various uh, uh, offshore um, entities that we have here in Canada. So there's not very many applications we haven't been involved in. And the newspapers, newspaper articles more and more and more, um, you see all these different uh, uh, scenarios or accidents that should never have happened, but they do. And the deployment, uh, and maintenance of a proper gas detection system in a lot of these scenarios uh, would have prevented anything like this happening. Um, so that's what we do. And we do it through a partners like uh, Odell Associates and uh, uh, companies like them throughout North America. So that's our presentation for today. Uh, if uh, you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them for you.
And you can do if you do have two questions, you can just add them to the to the chat there. We haven't had any yet. So I must have been very clear and concise. <laughs> <laughs> there. There's, There's one for you. Yeah, what, what was that? It, it flashed off, off my Sorry. screen. Sorry. Um, is there any minimum leakage rate requirements for sensors? Minimum leakage rate. Given that the sensors are constantly monitoring the ambient atmosphere, um, uh, and that ambient atmosphere is uh, constantly in motion, uh, natural diffusion and convection, um, if the airflow, if I understand your co question correctly, if the airflow uh, manages to get somewhere above uh, uh, 200 feet per minute over that sensor, uh, that sensor is not going to be as accurate as it could be if that air mo was not moving that quickly over it. Um, it takes time. Uh, even in electrochemical or uh, infrared energy, it takes a certain amount of time, Whether it, it, and even though it's only measured in milliseconds, if you think of uh, 200 uh, feet per minute uh, air movement, uh, that's quite a bit in, in milliseconds even. So the sensor elements um, would have a much better chance of, uh, of um, uh, reporting more accurately if that airflow wasn't uh, quite that high. If the goal, yeah, what was that? Um, if the goal of a mechanical ventilation system is to limit the exposure of workers to a contain or contaminant uh, based on PPM for a normal eight hour workday or 40 hour work week, is there a typical setup or arrangement to accomplish this? Minimum. Uh, in in most uh, scenarios, um, ASHRAE recommendations um, stipulate or, or recommend uh, minimum ventilation rates for uh, different uh, type scenarios. And their their handbook on indoor air quality control that they publish and make available for free on their website um, lists all those different uh, scenarios and the minimum ventilation rates that they feel are acceptable. And then the gas detection equipment can ramp up those rates if required um, to dilute through through ventilation any concentration of uh, target gas buildup. Whether that ramp up uh, in the in the best case scenario be via a VFD such that that VFD is being ramped up and down as required, or uh, simply uh, switching to a higher CFM, which I see mostly. Um, where they take a, a, a VFD and they have a minimum ventilation rate and then they want to go to a maximum for a period of time. That period of time being dependent on what the gas detection system is reporting uh, the concentrations uh, that they're, that the, of target gas that it is seeing. Give it another 10 or so seconds for anybody else to come out with a question. If not, uh, I appreciate it as always, Ron. I, I learned something new. I probably sat in on about ten of these with you over the years, but uh, always something new. And I and I uh, <laughs> love the analogies; they make me understand it even more. Um, <laughs> like I've, I've told everyone, um, we've. Uh, if you got the list of, of Ron's applications for these sensors, I will admit that the only one we haven't done are the ferries. So um, perhaps if they find one uh, going from Niagara, if they finally do the Niagara to Toronto or, or talk Which about that should. again, maybe we'll have that opportunity. Um, but for the rest, we have done. Um, if anybody has any questions after the fact, uh, feel free to reach out to your local Odell rep, whether it be myself, uh, Justin, Gallup, Mike Lett, Kale, it doesn't matter. Um, anybody will get answers. And if we can't, um, we can always reach out to Ron, who makes himself available at our, all hours of the day. I won't share your cell phone, but I have called him at weird hours. Um, and also, this does work towards your, it is accredited, so it does work towards your engineering hours um, if you need that for, for your yearly hours. So um, if there's nothing else, I will leave everyone with that. And uh, we appreciate everyone for, for attending and, and hopefully we all got something out of that. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you.
Thanks, Rob.